with Heiko Sunderman, who is Head of Asset and Wealth Management at EPAM Worldwide. Uh, we've just had a fascinating panel discussion here in Zurich, talking about uh, fee-based models and the transition to fee-based models in wealth management. Heiko was a, a member of that panel. I just wanted to catch up with him afterwards to get some more feedback on how he thought the panel went and what lessons and messages uh, he has based on the white paper that he's written on that very subject. Heiko, over to you. Well, thanks for that. Um, very interesting panel. Um, I have to admit there were a couple of new insights also for me. And uh, sometimes when you're too much in your own topic, then you think uh, you, have the, you have the holy grail to, to actually change the industry. And it was actually interesting to listen to, to the panel members. Um, and they had a couple of interesting new aspects to it. Absolutely, absolutely. My, my key messages still stand to hold true, though. Um, that is, execution-only models are dying. Um, that whole business model is challenged from, from the three corners, changing client expectations, increasing regulatory pressure, and uh, new competition coming from fintechs and the, and the, big, uh, the, the big tech companies. Um, the, the way out for banks is what we strongly believe and we're passionate around this. The way out, uh, out for banks is to engage clients into fee-based advising models. And that could be advisory models, so advisory mandates where the client is still in the driver's seat, or it could be discretionary mandates. Actually, we're, we're not differentiating that much. But for both of these models, it is extremely important for the bank to provide a compelling value proposition for the client. So why should I give you... Uh, why should I pay you money for you advising me? And I would like to really understand what is the value that you bring to me. And that must be more than, uh, um, uh, than access to research, or that must be more than having access to an investment advisor. What I want as a client is superior investment advice given by, given by a very structured process that, I can actually, that is transparent to me. I need to understand where the value is that the bank is bringing to me. Um, and probably I would like to have access to an advisor that actually orchestrates and, and has been given the tools by the bank to, um, to be able to orchestrate the full power of the, the bank as a platform. Are you getting any pushback from the banks on this? It sounds as if, as if it's a straightforward process, that, that all banks should be saying, yes, absolutely, we've got to embrace this. This is definitely the way, the way forward. What are the banks telling you? Um, I don't think that we see pushbacks. Um, the, the pushbacks that we're seeing, I mean, uh, most banks would agree to what I just said. I mean, most banks yeah. do see that they, that they need to provide this value proposition, that they're still struggling on what that is. We at EPAM believe it is a, it is a quantitative risk-based advisory approach that they need to embrace. Uh, on that one, I mean, there are differences of opinions. Um, most of the big players, they're actually asset managers, but also the big wealth managers, they actually, um, they would probably echo what I just said. Mm -hmm. The smaller players um, are shying away from that a little bit because it takes quite some investments into the, into the platform. It is, uh, it is requiring a strong CIO department, chief investment officer department. And the smaller players are probably more struggling in that to actually take I was investments. going to say, surely this plays to the strengths of the larger players. Yeah. And will the smaller players get left behind or will, will, will they find a niche? Or is it that the people in the middle, the banks in the middle, are the ones who have fall, fall through, through the cracks? Well, now I could say um, that is what we are there, there for. That is what EPAM is there for. So right. actually coming... We've been, we've been watching these mega investments at the big players, right? And I have to say, um, a couple of years ago, the first movers in that space were actually taking um, at hand like three-digit million budgets to actually get this whole process industrialized from CIO to down to the portfolio, uh, to the individual client's portfolio. That, as, is, as you can imagine, that is actually fundamentally transforming the full advisory value chain, and that required a lot of investment. Now, we've been watching this at EPAM, and uh, we've been helping these big players um, through that journey. And then we've been thinking, like, well, how can we actually help the, the tier two banks, the tier three banks? Mm -hmm. um, and whilst the big players actually embraced or tackled these projects by um, big custom build-outs, we are now partnering with uh, fintech companies um, like Swissquant, who was on the panel as well, mm -hmm. um, and uh, trying to stitch together individual components of this value chain. And again, EPAM is, is playing the role of the orchestrator so that we can actually bring down the implementation cost of these models. 
um, and de-risk those investments. Um, so um, I think we can also help the smaller banks to move in that area, in that space. So the value chain is served by players at each level. I take it that there's no fintech or no service provider that can provide the whole gamut of services no. to enable banks to go down the route of this model. And, and that it's a question of choosing which ones are most relevant, which no. ones work best with, uh, with, with the others, I'm guessing. Is that where EPAM helps too? I think that's exactly where we're trying to play. I mean, right. we're... We're having a D uh, engineering DNA, so we're always happy if we if we actually find clients to actually engage in in big custom software build outs. I mean, yeah. no doubt about that. Yeah. But nevertheless, we're especially in the wealth and asset management space. We're we're more and more moving up the yeah. moving up the value chain and becoming the orchestrator of uh, a whole partner network. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole move in the industries to embrace open APIs are helping us in that space. Sure. Um, but it's still um, the the integration cost of this is still is probably still the majority of the invest uh, compared to the license fees that a bank is paying to a fintech. So in terms of the number of fintechs, there are so many of them. How does a bank or another asset manager view them and and analyze them and know which ones are the best for what they're trying to do, and indeed the ones who are going to be there in a year's time or five five years time. Uh, these players, these fintechs, come and go, as you know. No, I'm with you. I'm, I mean, it's, it's almost impossible to, to um, hold an overview over the, the complete market. And it's more and more getting, it's getting more and more difficult, actually, to do this because there's so many new, new ideas coming up, so many new fintechs coming up. I think there's two strategies for banks. Either, and I think there, again, I think EPAM can, can help. I mean, that is, we are scanning the market constantly, and we're trying to... Uh, to actually scan the market, look for new ideas, look at interesting topics that we can integrate into our ecosystem, which is also a value proposition for those fintech providers, by the way, because yeah. it gives them a much better platform um, and a global reach that's, uh, that we can uh, give, them, uh, give, the, uh, give to them. Yes. Um, and that is one possibility, find a partner to actually help you navigate through that. And the other thing is, by the way, you need a partner that is able to lift, to open the hood, right? Because... Yeah. There's so many shiny, shiny objects out there, and yeah. fantastic GUIs. Um, but seriously, if you open the if you open the hood, um, uh, there's not much there. Sometimes there's not much there. The other alternative that banks have, and again, the big players are embracing the strategy, is um, to uh, to take equity stakes in those in those companies oh, right. yes, and uh, actually do co-development with them. Yes, 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 of course. And and you hear this term uh, used a lot: agile. Now, agile to me implies that you're building a plane when it's in flight. It's, it sounds very dangerous. It sounds as if uh, uh, fintechs uh, have an idea and have a bit of a, a, a skin and perhaps a, a good user interface or whatever it is, and, but nothing much to substantiate it. Is that a problem, do you think? Um, I think, now I need to be careful. Yeah. Right. Agile okay. is a good thing, okay, yeah. and we're a big promoter of Agile, and me right. personally, I am a big promoter of Agile. Yeah. Nevertheless, though, sometimes I'm feeling like the, the sorcerer's apprentice. Yeah. Um, it became, this whole word became made a life by its own, right? especially in big banks. And I think Agile, I would like to define Agile in two, two ways. Number one, it's a, it's a cultural shift, um, or it's a cultural change, um, purely describing that development projects are done in much closer collaboration between business and IT. Actually, those boundaries between business and IT should vanish in a, in a perfect Agile world. That's, that's probably, for me, the most important thing. The other aspect of Agile is, is just modern development technologies, uh, techniques, um, a proper tooling, um, um, uh, a much more iterative process to software development. And that is what I'm seeing as the tool bit of it. The other one is the cultural change. I have to say, um, Agile tends to be a little bit, uh, it's, the, it's the holy grail of everything. And, uh, and uh, it as I said, it, uh, it got a life by its own. Well, I suppose it's a move away from a very rigid approach, isn't it? You know, this is a problem. We're going to analyze it. We're going to... Uh, plan it and then we're going to do it stage by stage by stage and we're going to stick to that 
The world isn't like that anymore at all, is it? No, it is not. Um, nevertheless, though, I mean, uh, I can clearly understand any CEO or CFO or even this, uh, the, CEO, the, the head of business at a bank. In the end, there's still this aspect, you have an idea, you can describe the idea, and what you want to know is how long does it take and how much do I have to pay for it, mm -hmm. and, which is understandable, right? Yeah. I think what they need to embrace, though, is um, uh, building capacities, like building joint business and IT capacities to embark on this and, and have this really internalized this thinking of, uh, of a minimal viral product. So what is, the, what is the core of the product that we need to build first? Let's try to test that on the market and then iteratively, iteratively improve it, right? Um, in the, in the old days, um, if I was a business stakeholder, I, I voiced my idea and obviously I tried to put as many requirements in there as possible in the hope that 70% uh, is going to, deliver, uh, to, to be delivered with uh, only 150% of the budget that I was asking for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so, so I suppose the whole agile movement is to stop uh, huge investments just falling over. Yeah. And, exactly. and being completely wasted. So fail early. Yeah, fa fail I early. think fail early is the, is the key word. And fail early and close business. And fail small. <laughs> fail small <laughs> and close color, uh, and business to take, to take ownership of the product as right. well and not okay. just throw ideas over the fence and make it the problem of the IT department uh, to, take, to bear the risk of the implementation. Okay. Well, Heiko, it's been great to talk to you. Thank you Thanks very much indeed for your Thanks time. Thanks a lot. Thank you.